Hello and welcome to episode 18 of MMO Weekly presented by, as always, by MetsmerizedOnline.com. I'm your host, Sal Manzo. Panel looks a little different this week. Mike's taking the day off. We got John Luke Shaparo, actually our producer of the show, making his on-screen debut and MMO contributor. Very excited about that. And we're also joined by a third of the host of the uh, a part of their own podcast from Amazing Avenue, Maggie Wigan. Maggie, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Now, we mentioned, obviously, you're uh, one of the first all-female Mets podcasts out there. It's, it's sponsored by um, Amazing We're Avenue. Only we love- all-female Only. Mets See, podcast. that's even better. Exactly. <laughs> so, and starting off with that, uh, we saw that you have a fundraiser coming up. Uh, I believe it's at City Field. Um, the fourth annual Dollars for Dingers fundraiser, all proceeds benefit National Domestic Violence Hotline. I just wanted you to tell us about that. Plug it as much as you can. Where is it going to be? What folks can do to donate things of that nature? We want to hear all about it. So please start with that. So this is um, this is like one of my favorite things that we do every year. Um, and it's called Dollars for Dingers. And it started as you know, our first year of the podcast. We we're like, let's um, let's pledge for every home run the Mets hit in the month of September. And um, that was also, it was 2019, that was the year that uh, Pete Alonzo just decided to, like, go nuclear in September. So he's always been, like, our Dollars for Dingers mascot. We adore what Pete has done for us. Um, and so so that's the basic idea is that you tell us how much you're going to donate per dinger. And um, we do the math and we tell you at the end of the month. And we add it all up and it's always pretty amazing. Um, the... The organization is called the National Domestic Violence Hotline, and they are um, just one of the most important organizations out there right now because they do the work. You know, they um, are just providing services 24-7 online, over the phone. They are just like the experts on everything around domestic violence and providing support in whatever ways they can. So it's a really amazing organization to be able to support. Um, and what's coming up that is super fun is every year now we do a raffle. And um, so this year it's going to be at Ebbs, which is just outside of City Field. Gotcha. Um, like mm-hmm. it's the space where Mickler was up until last year. And um, and they have given us their whole back room. And we have this incredible array of um, of prizes that folks can buy raffle tickets for. And um the and so we have um we have signed baseballs for awesome. francisco lindor and pete alonzo and we also have t-shirts and hats and cups and you know we've got donations from athlete logos sent us a neon awesome. sign that is um it's gary carter and it's amazing and wow. <laughs> like i know it would probably look really bad if i won it but i kind of want to throw like a hundred bucks at it because <laughs> it's just so beautiful Um, So that, and yes, so that's at Ebbs at City Field and that's this Saturday and it starts at 4 PM. And, you know, so we, everybody's going to want to get into the game. Everyone's going to want to get that bobblehead. So we will have ways for everybody to, you know, if they want to go in before the drawing happens, we'll have everybody's contact info. Um, Ebbs will hold on to your prizes. um, If you want to pick them up after the game, Uh, You know, we're all just we're just really excited to get to reach as many Mets fans as possible because, um, you know, we're just really lucky to be there like on a game day. And so it's a great opportunity. It's going to be so much fun. Oh, and there's drink specials, uh, food and drink specials. If you buy raffle tickets, you get a wristband. We got wristbands Um, and you get 15 percent off your meal and beer at um, at Ebbs, which is some very good beer if you haven't had it yet. Awesome. So yeah. <laughs> I was uh, I, I was I was taking a look at the um, the uh, Google Doc that you have, and I noticed you have a, a lot of a lot of names, a ton of names on there with like a couple of extra perks as well. Like I see you have the the um, the initial pledge per home run, and then you have the extra pledge. And some of these here are actually pretty <laughs> pretty cool, actually. Um, the one that mentions uh, Steve Gelbs too here. But the one thing I wanted to one thing I wanted to ask you though too is so you've been doing this since you said 2019, correct? Now have you seen it? Have you seen it gone up, go up every year in terms of activity, attendance, and participation? It really has. Um, so you know, the first year we were doing this, we raised about eight thousand um, dollars in pledges, and then another thousand in the raffle. Um, and 2020 was a little abbreviated. I think it was abbreviated for most of us. And we actually we did shift our focus that year, and we um, raised money for the uh, New York City Food Bank. Um, 
and you know, but we we put together a couple thousand dollars. It was really amazing given where everyone was at the time. Um, and then last year, between the raffle and the pledges, we raised over twelve thousand wow. um, dollars wow. for the National Domestic Violence Hotline again. So um, and so far, you know, we are uh, we are at the Ides of September the fifteenth, and on pledges alone, we have um, we're just about to break the six thousand mark. We are like creeping up on that. And that's, you know, before any of the raffle tickets and, you know, the entire second half of the month of September, when I am personally hoping the Mets power output improves, <laughs> like, at all. It would like, it would be kind of a win-win. Yeah, well, so, we're, we're, yeah. we're going to get, we're going to get to that, the Mets stuff in a second. Oh, here. absolutely. I, but I do want to, like, I, I do want to mention ahead. though the extras, because that was just a little thing that we had started, like, you know, and even even this year, you know, mine was like, I'll donate extra for every Mark Canna bomb because, um, you know, on the podcast, we also pick our dudes for like the under uh, appreciated guy coming into the season who we think is going to really pop. And Canna was my guy. So, you know, obviously mm -hmm. my extra has to be. Um, but people come up with just like the most amazing ideas, like the number of times Narco is played at City Field <laughs> Or um, the number of runs scored for Jacob Degrom <laughs> in his starts. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's just we even we do have a couple of like Yankee fans who will uh, pledge for things that are not good for the Mets. Which, like, okay, <laughs> <sighs> fine. <laughs> hey, look, a donation is yeah. a donation. Why exactly. not? Exactly. <laughs> look, look, their money spends as well as anybody else's. But exactly, still no, have nobody. To Nobody's perfect, even Yankee fans. But if they're willing to shell out, we'll, we'll, we'll turn a blind eye for a day, right? Exactly. Absolutely. Exactly. That's um, that's awesome. So I, and obviously, you mentioned with the start of the podcast that this was something that that you know you 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 know decide you want to do. But you know, in particular, like, what is there? You know, a certain reason that you chose this organization, wanted to do something with this. I think it's amazing. You know, tying in baseball is something that's obviously so serious and so important. Mm -hmm. So I'm just kind of curious, you know, where where the inspiration kind of came from that. Well, you know, I mean, one of the focuses of our podcast is, you know, social justice issues of all kinds. And that includes, you know, the, the domestic violence stories that mm -hmm. perpetually arise in, uh, in baseball and all sports and, you know, the world. We always say we will we'll stop raising money for domestic violence when baseball stops making it right. a problem. Right. So, um, and then actually, you know, this organization I found because uh, a friend of mine was a survivor. And when we decided we wanted to do this, I went to her. And I said, you know, do you like, do you have an organization where right. you want us to send this money? And um, and so now every year I get to update her with what we've done. And I mean, and she's she's in a wonderful place. She's super, you know, happy in, in her life. But it, I just being able to do that for her, even though that's a very far away time for us, right. is um, it feels really special. That's awesome. And, you know, obviously kind of talking about different issues, obviously social issues and everything else, I kind of wanted to, I guess, pivot a little bit as far as the unionization. Obviously, you know, Major League or Minor League Baseball finally, you know, was able to put a union forth. And now the, you know, Major League Players Union and Major League Baseball is honored. Just want to get your thoughts on that real quick. You know how you feel about it. I know this is, you know, a lot of fans and people, myself included, have been kind of, you know, pounding the door at this forever. And it felt like, and not, not to be negative, but it almost felt like, a lost cause in the sense that it just felt like major league baseball was going to continue to, you know, fall on deaf ears and never do anything and kind of let this happen. But it's, it's really cool to see in the last few years, I think with the presence of social media and everything else to kind of help these, you know, minor league players to get, you know, representation and, you know, a seat at the table, so to speak. I just want to get your thoughts on that, you know, with the, after the news break. Well, definitely, you know, especially after the, the lockout in the off season, you know, there were really two, um, two takeaways from that. And one is that MLB is not, taking them seriously as a labor union right, right. Um, is not particularly interested in treating them well or seeming as though they're treating them well. Right. But that also um, that the players were actually extremely angry and mm -hmm. very like vocal about it, which is not something you tend to associate with baseball players as right. being vocal about anything off the field. That's just right. not their, that's not their vibe. Um, so that was the, and, and that was sort of the, the anger was the part that made me feel good. That right. made me feel like, like something's different than it was in the past. But even with that feeling, um, the fact that this happened so quickly was it just like totally blew all, all of us over at a pot of their own, you know, just yeah. 
every every week we're like and now we have this update that doesn't include mlb refusing to answer anyone's phone calls <laughs> like it was um it really just picked up steam so fast and i think a lot of that um I mean, a lot of that is due to the work that people have been putting in for years right. Right. to drive this issue because it has been an absolutely essential one for a long time. Um, and then also the the Major League Players Union of um, of making that connection and you know having them in the same union is um, is really fantastic too because it just reminds MLB that like they are they are united um, right. that. Right. Those are not two groups of people that you can play off each other. Now, is the power differential still there? Right. Of course it is. But um, it's a step towards being able to work together. And that's, you know, that's what they need to be able to do. Yeah, and I, I think, and John Luke, I'm going to have you hop in a second, but I, I really, you know, to the point that you made there as far as, you know, now both sides, the minor league players union and the major league players are on one side. It's not a, a house divided, so to speak, which I think Major League Baseball really wanted, right? They probably wanted the mm -hmm. two sides not on the same side because it makes it e easier for them not to kind of, you know, have this happen. But it's fine. I worked with an organization last year um, that was really pushing this. And behind closed doors, you know, even they said we put a proposal together. They brought it to the players union and, you know, the players union was scared. They didn't want to take that leap. Um, because, you know, of the dealings that would happen with Major League Baseball and also there was a lockout coming. So they didn't want to, I guess, lose leverage, so to speak. But it's just even within a year's time, how how quickly everything moved. And, you know, I guess uh, to 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 good, um, you know, all the backlash, you know, Major League uh, Baseball was facing. They, they couldn't really, you know, turn a blind eye anymore, which I think is awesome. Mm -hmm. So, you know, John Luke, I want you to chime in real quick as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and I think one of the main uh, reasons or one of the big catalysts of this really getting pushed through um, it was the presence of social media, actually. Mm -hmm. um, you know, advocates for minor leaguers, a lot of their employees were absorbed yep. by the MLBPA, which, you know, basically allowed them to continue that, you know, right. task, but on a more official note. But I think once COVID hit, I mean, it was, I guess you could say it's kind of like, a, I mean, you never want to say COVID, you know, COVID's never a good thing, but the silver lining within COVID right. is that there were a lot of things that needed to be addressed within the organizations of just Major League Baseball and the foundations of how um, things are set and how they operate. And, you know, there were a lot of minor leaguers on Twitter that were basically going about and saying, this is how much I make. They're showing their tick, their, their check stubs and, you know the use of social media really amplified that. Yep. So I think for years and years and years and years, Major League Baseball, and you know, it was alluded to here that they were able to just basically ignore that because right. there was no real platform for it. But now with the presence of social media and with the advancement for minor leaguers, you know, coming about, you know, it really, and also with the, the lockout as well, it really right. brought forth this wave and you know like you said it was just such a shock like even myself i was surprised by it i thought this was right. going to happen next uh spring during spring right. training or something right. but it happened right now in the middle of the uh playoff race in major league baseball it really goes to show you how far they have gotten and it's such a beautiful thing to see because now people are paying attention right you know and then people say oh no it's just baseball it's just a sport but the truth of the matter is is that yeah you know you could say it's a sport or whatever but these people go day in and day out working their rear ends off just to try and make a career for a sport that they love and you have to give them credit for that so why not offer them something to you know live off of not have to you know do a bunch of jobs off the right. side i think it's great and i think this is just absolutely wonderful Absolutely. And like to your point, you know, minor league baseball plays, it's a full-time job. They work out, they practice, they play every day. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and, and, you know, everywhere else in the world and in every other sector, you make a living wage when you work full-time. So, you mm -hmm. know, minor league baseball shouldn't be any different. Also shout out Francisco Lindor, apparently behind closed doors. He was a big push for this hard. Um, I really give him a lot of credit. Him and Scherzer together with the lockout stuff, them heading everything for the players union. I was super impressed with seeing all that. Um, but then to hear Lindor come out, you know, and say how he pushed this, he supported this. This, this is something that they've wanted for a long time. Just awesome. Um, wish, you know, you know, hopefully things get better for the minor leaguers now and they can kind of, again, you know, Major League Baseball doesn't prey on people's dreams because that isn't cool. And these guys work their butts off and they're the future. They're the lifeblood of your sport. So you should treat Absolutely. them good. Um, so I'm happy about that. Um, and I guess, you know, from there, I want to transition to um, what's going on today, Roberto Clemente Day. Um, obviously, Mets and Pirates are playing right now. Awesome ceremony pregame. I want to get your thoughts real quick about it, guys. And Maggie, I'll start with you. Just kind of the pregame ceremonies that the Mets had today right before the game, honoring all the past winners. 
Carlos Carrasco getting a warm up in right field while they announced him. That was super cool. I uh, just want to get your initial reactions to, to that before we kind of delve into it more. Um, I was with my son doing his homework during That's the okay. ceremonies, um, but we read a really nice story about a pet store and he answered all the questions correctly. Nice. So, um, <laughs> I will cede it to John Luke on this one. <laughs> That's okay. Well, at least you know, one person I... did their homework today. <laughs> <laughs> well, you Two know, people. Well, one of the things I always like about um, these opening ceremonies, at mm -hmm. least of late, is that they always, they, they at least to me personally, because this really does hit me, you know, hit home for me because right. I am a Puerto Rican American. Yep. Um, and, you know, it's always nice to see just the fact that you had, you know, not only just former winners, but also other Puerto Rican players as well. You know, Carlos Delgado's in attendance, Carlos Beltran, you know, Ivan Rodriguez, just numerous others. And it's just, you know, similar to how they celebrate Jackie Robinson. Right. You know, I, I just love the way that they just honor it, you know, and I know that sounds very generic, but there's just so much to just digest within that ceremony that that's really only the way that I can really say it because there's not one part that I like on its own. It's just universally just really nice to see because, you know, Roberto Clemente was huge within the baseball community and just, right. just the human community, just humanity in general, yep. you know. So I, I, I always love to see it. And I just, I just love the fact that it's, it's being put out there and it's amplified and I like it when they do it. And it really makes me feel nice and warm and fuzzy inside, you know? <laughs> no, absolutely. And, you know, talk, you know, talking about kind of your background, I was just wondering as far as like growing up, did your parents, you know, anyone at home kind of talk, tell you about Lebron Clemente, them growing up, watching him play the things oh. that he did, like were there stories, like, cause <laughs> everything we watched in pregame, like it, He's like a god in Puerto Rico, obviously to for a great reason. It's like everyone that plays ball and is from there knows the story, not just the baseball side, but like you said, the humanitarian side. So I was just wondering if you had like any stories that anyone told you growing up in particular that ever stuck with you. So, you know, my dad being from Puerto Rico, he he, you know, he played um, you know, ball out there. And nope. like you said, it, it's it's true he is considered like a, a living and he is, you know, he's considered like a God out there yep. because the one, the one thing about just coming from a country like that or a place like that. And, and this goes for any, you know, Latin American country or any country that's, you know, like considered third world or, you know, not like the United States is that, you know, like Mar how Mariano Rivera is to, you know, um, Panama and how, right. you know, Pedro Martinez is to Dominican Republic, you know, um, it's very poor and, you you see that someone of your own came from that sort of lifestyle and was able to make it big to the biggest league. You know, t you you could watch a you could watch a ball game anywhere, and you see that that someone from where you're from is doing that. It just gives you hope. When I was a kid, um, and when I started getting into baseball, um, my dad would just tell me stories about because you know, dad huge Mets fan. He told me that he would watch him on TV on WOR and just watch Clemente just absolutely tear the Mets up. <laughs> and, you know, it's famously known that he got his, you know, 3,000 hit against the right. New York Mets, you know, right. um, which I think was the final hit of his career. Yep. Um, fitting, fitting enough, you know. <laughs> um, but, you know, I would just hear stories about how he would just, wa you know, watch him on TV. And right. you just see this, you see this sense of pride when he would talk about it. And then, you know, me being the curious cat that I am, I would do the research and I just immensely became proud, you know, right above my computer screen. As I point this way, there's a huge Puerto Rican flag nice. up on my, on, up on my door. And he, he embodied Clemente. He embodied what being a Puerto Rican is, you know, it's a very collect, uh, a very collectivistic culture. We embrace everyone, you know, when, Puerto Ricans came to the United States, you know, in the forties and fifties, we became one with the culture and we gave back to the culture, you know, and Clemente, not only baseball wise was a, a legend, but he was also a legend in the community as well, right. you know, and it's, it's funny. It's not, it's, it's more, you know, it, it's really interesting to point out that he played for the Pittsburgh pirates. Right. And if there's anything, you know, about Pittsburgh, you know, Fred Rogers is from Pittsburgh. And the fact that those two were in the same place, in the same timeline right. for pretty much most of their adult lives. It's, it's really heartwarming to me. Clemente was, you know, I think there was a story about like how he would go, there were stories about him going to the people who are less fortunate. He would give gloves to kids. He would just right. go to the Island, play ball with kids, right. you know, um, 
And, and there's another thing too that was actually also pretty interesting. And I apologize if I'm going back and no, forth. No, please, please. This is this is a very uh, very big subject for me. Yeah. And I'm trying to make sure I capture it all together. Um, so today, obviously, it's the um, Tampa Bay Rays field right. the all Latin lineup, and that's yep. huge. You know, um, it harkens back to when the Pittsburgh Pirates in September of '71 put together the all black lineup. Yep. So you had, you know, guys like Willie Stargell and, you know, uh, Gene Kleins and Al Al Oliver and all that. Um, so when they were having a press conference, Clemente, I'm paraphrasing here, basically said that we're all one, we're together, you know. And that was just basically the man himself. And every Puerto Rican kid, you know, Lindor, myself, right. you know, Pudge Rodriguez, Carlos Delgado, Carlos Beltran, you name it. He is the pinnacle, and we all strive to try and be like that. It is very special in our hearts, and sometimes I get a bit emotional talking about it because, you know, the tragic way that he passed, unfortunately. Right. But um, he he, le he left a huge, you know, legacy for us to follow, and I just – every time this time of year comes around, I just absolutely love it. I, I went to PNC Park for the first time last year, and I got the chance just to stand in front of the nice. statue, and it's like – so I'm getting a little emotional talking about this. Um, he, it's like, he's so special to us that like, that's our guy. And to see that he's being celebrated just really means a lot to just not only Puerto Ricans, but just, you know, just baseball fans in general, you know? Right. Sorry. <laughs> I got a, I'm getting a little, got a little, no. going on so, so somebody that was that good, but then just as good or better as a human, there's not oh, yeah. enough you could talk about. I mean, you right. know, and I don't want to ramble on either, but, you know, the stories that they tell, you know, he would, you know, go to children's hospitals and, and basically threaten the hospital and say, if, if any, if any reporters show up, if any, anything gets publicized, mm -hmm. I'll never come back. Right. Just that seems like the kind of person he was. And just even with the plane, you know, with, you know, as far as the plane was overloaded, it was older, but he promised that he was going to bring relief and he, you know, stubborn in the best way. Mm -hmm. wanted to bring that and wanted to help his community. And, you know, it's just, it, I think it's, it's, it's tragic that, you know, his legacy and he didn't get to see the love that, that he deserved while he, you know, when he was alive, cause he obviously went through a lot in Pittsburgh being mm -hmm. a Latin ball player during that time, but just, you know, to be able to persevere for everything, play as well as he did and do all that. It's, it's just uh it's an incredible legacy. And, you know, uh, I think I have I one get, more point as well. And just one more thing. It just dawned Absolutely. upon me. He was also, you know, you know, Maggie mentions, you know, discussing social justice right. you know he was also very big with that as well yep. um whenever there was an injustice with the african-american ball players or the other hispanic ball players clemente spoke up right. he would he would speak out against the you know the management of the pittsburgh pirates and you know when he was playing in the minor leagues whether it was in you know down south for spring training or whatever right. you know he spoke out he was very big on making sure that not only just one peop one type of person got preferential treatment. Right. That everybody got preferential treatment because the human race as a whole is as important. Doesn't matter what color skin you are, you shouldn't be treated a certain way because of your pigmentation. Right. He was very big on that, you know. And again, I'll just reference the you know the all the all black lineup. He made it a point to unify with everyone on that day because he knew it was important. Basically, following the footsteps of Jackie Robinson, right? You know, right. and they they really do come from the same ilk. So yeah. I think that's important to also note. Absolutely. And Maggie, I'm going to ask you something real quick. I, I think it's, it's gotta, it's going to happen sooner or later. They're going to retire 21 league wide. I think that they should, it's a long time coming. So oh, with that, nice. right. And I think that, you know, the next question I guess I have for you is, you know, besides 21, who do you think would, will be the next league wide number? I have a couple of players at the top of my head, but I'm curious to, you know, you guys might think if, you know, anyone at, uh, assuming Clemente happens, so I think it's going to happen very soon. It really, it should at this point. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm curious if there's any players that you could think of that you think should get there. Also, their number retired kind of league wide. You know, when it's all said and done. I mean, that's a great question. Um, and I'd certainly, I mean, it's it's hard to think of anyone who is kind of close to that same um, mold right. of Jackie Robinson and mm -hmm. Clemente. That they are really kind of in a category of their own. Right. Just for, for a number of reasons and yep. different for each of them. And it's hard to say that there's anybody, um, you know, of that same cut. Right, right. But certainly, you know, you know, someone just like, someone like Willie Mays, mm -hmm. you know, is a conversation happening. One of the names I had in my head too, yep. That's, yeah, that, that's kind of the, you know, the 
the third name that comes up that just feels like it would be right. Yeah. John Luke, anyone that comes to mind for you? Um, uh, let's see. Obviously, you know, she mentioned Willie Mays, which I think is mm -hmm. a great point. Um, I really, honestly, I really can't think of anyone that would have stood out mm -hmm. in that aspect. Um, and having significance, like, right. Well beyond the team. Right. right. Level. That to I me think, is like the, mm -hmm. the litmus test. To me, the only after Clemente, the, and, and Willie Mays is a great one. I agree with that. Obviously he's still alive. So I, you know, I don't know what they'll do there. Shout out to Mets for a time. His number. That was really cool. That was, a, that was an awesome surprise for old Thomas day. But um, to me, the other, the immediate name, the plus Hank Aaron, I think, you know, mm -hmm. eventually hammer and Hank 44, get it retired. I think, you know, obviously he's not the, the technically the home run King, but I think if you ask most baseball fans, he's still that mm -hmm. um, everything he did endured with all that um, was a pioneer for baseball and also what, you know, uh, you know, social justice issues as well. And all he had to endure, you know, breaking baby was rested record. Everyone knows that, um, you know, I think he would be a, a good guy. Now, again, you know, you, you don't, it's one of those things where it's, you know, not everyone's number is going to get retired league wide thing like that. It's for the mm -hmm. best of the best of the best. But uh, right. I think if, if you put those three guys together on a Mount Rushmore of number retirements, um, you know, Jackie Robinson, Roberto Clemente, Hank Aaron. I don't think anybody's going to have any problems. And oh, you absolutely. can throw Willie Mays in there too, you know, really rounded out in the top four of a route much more. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know if there's, you know, four better players that embody, you know, the, the heart that it takes on the field and then all, also off the field of being, you know, a, a great human and a great person and enduring mm -hmm. so much. Obviously, you know, Rob Manfred, if you're listening, you should put that in, you know, we should push that forward. I, I don't even need credit. It's fine. Um, <laughs> Agreed. But, uh, I, <laughs> I'm with you on that. Yes. But uh, I think uh, I think that would be really cool. And I and I like, you know, I like that they do Roberto Clemente Day and it's get it gets more and more traction, hopefully, you know, at least for a number of time at that that uh you know kind of pushes that forward, hopefully. But mm -hmm. I wanna kind of transition from talking about Roberto to now finally getting to the Mets. Uh, I wanna talk about oh. nice things first, you know. <laughs> um, keep it positive. Absolutely. But um, well, the last time Mike and I were on this show, which was like a week and a half ago, things were really good. Things were, uh, were, were looking nice. It's kind of gotten off the rails since then. Um, you know, we, we know what's happened the last few days, getting swept, uh, by the Cubs, um, it's losing two out of three. To, excuse me. It's not what you want. No, nope. I if, <laughs> lifeless net, you know, I, it's one of those things where it happens in a baseball season, but it's a bad time to start picking, you know, to start playing down the bad teams. Not, not mm -hmm. a good time of the year to do it. So, you know, Maggie, I'll start with you. I just kind of want to get your thoughts on, you know, the last you know week or so with the Mets and how you're feeling right now. I mean, it was there was a period where it was starting to get a little frustrating because mm -hmm. it felt like they were mostly just treading water. And mm -hmm. it was like they would get you know, a couple of really good games in there, like really good. And then, you know, just embarrassment, but then it would be really good again. And and it's almost like they just kept forgetting the the really good games yep. and just had the embarrassments like repeatedly, like one in a <laughs> row. Um, and I mean, the good news is they seem to be, at least last I checked, they were at least turning it around a bit tonight, but like, I know. I mean, I can't even say like they just need to hit because they right. do just need to hit, but they also need to pitch. Like that's okay. the two problems that the Mets are having right now are the hitting <laughs> and the pitching, which um, is yeah, like it's not what you want. But um, it's also it's not the kind of slump that necessarily makes you think that it's going to be like this for a while, even mm -hmm. if it feels like it. Like when you're in the pit, it's kind of hard to imagine being out of the pit. Um, but there's, it's just a good baseball team and they're yep. playing real bad baseball, but like it's there, you can see the possibilities for them coming together like that. You know, it's, it's there. They just have mm -hmm. to get the pieces rolling at the same time. I think Max coming back is going to be huge. Starling Marte coming back is going to be huge. Absolutely. And, mm -hmm. you know, they've been very lucky that neither of these are likely to be very long injuries because right, it's right. certainly not a coincidence that right. things went from bad to worse when they dropped those two guys. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. John Luke, let me hear what you got. <sighs> okay. I'm going to try and be as positive as I can because please no, try as, as of both of, you know, this team has scarred us immeasurably for so long. Um, I was, you know, just as a quick footnote, I was seeing on Twitter, which was probably my mistake um, <laughs> that someone was comparing this to 2007 
No. And I'm saying to myself, wait a minute. That's this is nothing like 2007. I was I was 15 when 2007 happened, and that was probably 10 times worse than what this is nothing. My take on it is basically so like like Maggie said, they they're they're playing bad, but they had these spurts of good games. It's mm-hmm. like, you know, you you have these two solid games against the Los Angeles Dodgers where they just show absolute guts and fortitude and they just put their nose to the grindstone and just completely took on you know the Dodgers and I, I was there for the the afternoon game and they just looked like a complete ball club and then they play the Nationals you know I I, I and I'm thinking what the heck is going on Peterson is you know throwing duds they just stopped hitting you know Joey Manessis is terrorizing us who 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 would have imagined that Joey Manessis <laughs> terrorizing the Mets come on are you kidding me um then, you know, they go to Miami, they lose game one. It's like, oh, great, you know, but you try to stick it out. But then they decide to show up and then do the same exact thing in Pittsburgh. Now, right. I was there for all three of those games. Oh, man. First game. To- oh. Yeah. Then the next two, the doubleheader, they absolutely kill it. You know, yep. they scored, oh, I want to say at least just about 20 runs combined. Yeah, right. Yeah, those yeah, games. Yeah. And then I'm saying to myself, I'm coming back from Pittsburgh. And I'm like, this is great. We're going to kill it. You know, the heck with the Cubs and this and that and the fourth. And they just completely drop the ball. My gosh. So, you know, in between, like I said, those Marlins, the Marlins starts, you know, it's like, what the heck is going on? So right. basically, um, the, the way I can put it is this. It's the worst possible time. You know, it's a long season. You guys alluded right. to it. It's a long season. It's going to happen. Teams are going to get cold. You don't want to play down to teams, especially at this time. But I think what's gotten a lot of people and me, you know, a little bit worried is that, you know, it seems like even though you can see them getting out of it, it could possibly turn into something where they really develop bad habits. Like, for example, right. Pete Alonzo. One of my big things about him is that he loves chasing the pitch on the outside mm-hmm. corner, which is like a breaking ball for the most yep. part. Or he likes to chase the high fastball, yep. especially when it's like two feet out of the strike zone. Yep. And then what makes matters worse is that whenever a team throws a lefty in there, they just can't seem to hit regardless. Yeah. And then you mentioned the Darren Ruff trade. Hey, we traded D- J.D. Davis and a bunch of minor leaguers that will never see the day. Let's get mad about it. Am I a fan of the trade? Not really. Did I think it was a terrible trade? Not really. Am I going to lose my mind that Darren Ruff is hitting? You know, he was like two for his last 45 or something or something along the lines of that. Yeah, it's a little concerning. So my, my guess is this. It's a little concerning, yes. Will they get out of it? Probably. This is a very good baseball team, best team we've seen in yeah. – ever invest at least in my lifetime best team i've seen in my lifetime um but it is a little worrisome you know if if Marte comes back and then scherzer comes back and then you have uh mcgill smith and possibly even lucasi if they have right. a spot for him then I, I think they'll be okay but you know i, I think it's a little worrisome I, i'm a little worried you know and you know obviously now you know at the time of this recording they're beating pittsburgh right now right. but you hope that they can take that and take it into the weekend you know, like like Maggie said, and, and you know, you alluded to as well, Sal, is that this is a good team, and they're not. This is not 2019. This is not 2021, right. where you know one little setback is just going to throw them off the cliff. So all in all, I think they'll be okay. But I am a little worried though. The pitching is holding up a little bit. You know, Degrom could have had a little bit of a better start. Same for Bassett. Safe, safe. So could Peterson. But they're all really good enough to just not fall into that same trap again it's more the offense than anything i didn't even mention vogel back i'm not even going to because everybody knows i don't even <laughs> have to mention vogel back i mean he drove in a run as we record this but you know i mean you know your scar is i think that was his first extra base hit in like three weeks but he, yeah he finally got one and i think i might have been at that game in person to see his <laughs> last extra base hit that's a long well, time I think ago what's so frustrating about all of this is that it was all so predictable and like, you know, it, it right. would be one thing, you know, oh, this person got hurt or, you know, that position just started to fall apart. But like, no, they went into the trade deadline with big holes in the lineup, at, right. especially at DH and yep. in the bullpen. And yep. they really did not make 
any significant effort to nope. address either of those problems. No. And shockingly, here we are. <laughs> and what are the problems? Like who right. could have known? Mm -hmm. No, I, I completely agree with you there. And I was, I was going to make that point to you as well, as far as, you know, this isn't an overly deep team. You know, you're starting one through nine, your starters, they're good. Um, unfortunately, the Braves have a deeper team, I would say. And to your point, Maggie, I think your, your sentiment is the same everyone felt. You know, when they traded Holderman away for Vogelback, um, Mike had mentioned this on our last show. You know, Billy Epler had said they felt comfortable with doing that because there was a robust reliever market. So that led everyone to believe that they were going to get, you know, a high leverage guy, especially a left-handed high leverage guy. They did not. They got Michael Givens, who he's pitched much better of late. I give him credit. I know he pitched for Showalter in Baltimore, all that. You know, underwhelming. The rough trade, it is what it is now. You know, I think a big problem is in general they've gotten zero out of their DH spot all year. And the fact that they've really been able to hide that is a credit to Pete Alonso and Stalin Marte because I think everybody knows, and, and John Luke, you mentioned Pete, his struggles. This, this offense goes as Alonso and Marte go, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Um, when they struggle, especially when Alonzo struggles, um, you could see that, you know, the offense as a whole kind of slows down against left-handed pitching. That's obviously a struggle for them all year too. Um, but you know, it just seems like they're kind of out of their approach tonight. They're a little bit more, they're turning the wheel. Guys are getting base hits at least right now. Um, it seems like they've gotten away from that the last few weeks. This guy's kind of over swinging, not taking what the, mm -hmm. you know, the situation is given to them. Um, but another thing, and also to your point, Maggie, as far as the pitching, you know, David Peterson can't start a game again. Trevor Williams has to be your fifth starter for the rest of the season. He is now shown. I'd rather, I'd rather Williams be up there. Anytime. Absolutely. I think, Agreed. I mean, I think the last ditch effort at saving David Peterson's season has to be sending him down to AAA and having Absolutely. him pitch as a reliever, period. Yep. And, I and unfortunately. I don't want to start a game anywhere yeah. in this system for the rest of the season. Agreed. And he, I figured he's going to be your high, quote unquote, high leverage lefty guy in the playoffs. He's going to mm -hmm. have to be that because Jolie Rodriguez oh, is okay. not consistent enough to be no able to trust him. Claudio's and, been better. Claudio yes, he has. Be no, he has. I just Michael feel like, you know. Down the, the stretch, teams. like you're gonna have they never transitioned Peterson to the bullpen, which I didn't really get because I feel like you're gonna need him. And now with the last couple starts he's had, you know, now he, his confidence is probably shot. So mm -hmm. now, you know, uh uh, you know, move to the bullpen is probably gonna be looked at like a demotion to him. So I don't know how that'll kind of play out. Um, but Maggie, I completely agree that I think most of this stems from the Mets sitting on their hands at the deadline. And mm -hmm. I, I've said it, it felt like you know, for a team that obviously is all in to win this year with between the manager, the signings that they made, everything, um, you know, half the team going to be free agents at the end of the year. They got stingy at the wrong time. They decided to get stingy at the wrong time. You know, uh, Mark Vientos, I'm glad he's up finally. Um, I don't agree with, with Andy Martino's article that he put out. Well, I'll agree to disagree with what he said. Um, I felt he should have been up in June. The mm -hmm. Mets decided not to do that. And then the other, um, the beginning or the end of August, they decided not to. Um, you know, I know with they, they brought up, um, uh, I forget the infielder's name now, the guy who can't hit who played for the Tucks, um, Marrero. Devin Marrero. They decide, yeah, they yeah. decided to bring him up, which literally just for a glove. <laughs> that probably doesn't even bring a bat with him. Um, nope. So that was a waste. But at least with Guillaume back, they decided they could bring Vientos up. I don't care about his defense because I don't need to see him play the field. He needs to be in yes, the head against lefties. That's what mm -hmm. you're there for. Um, you know, I don't know how you guys feel about that. I thought that was, you know, late to bring him up to begin with. I figured if you weren't, if you weren't willing to part with him at the deadline for, you know, uh, an upgrade at DH, like, you know, with JD Martinez, so to speak, someone like that, you felt that he was important enough to keep, then bring him up, let him hit. So mm -hmm. hopefully, you know, he can catch, you know, lightning in a bottle a little bit now down the stretch, see how much they play him. But I just kind of wanted to get you guys' thoughts too on, you know, what your thoughts would be on those finally coming up. Well, I mean, I'm we'll start with Maggie. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm glad he's finally up. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't love how he looks, right. and I kind of suspect that's why he wasn't up before. Right. But that also like that also points to the issue with like if he wasn't up before because he's kind of still pretty rough. Right. Um. Then all the more reason to have used him in the trade deadline. Right. Like this mm -hmm. isn't you know this isn't like a superstar ceiling player right. you just have to hold on to until he like yeah. really puts it all together like he is who he is and yeah. you know, who he mm -hmm. is is probably better than he looks right now right um mm -hmm. and you should definitely be getting some regular abs as much as possible to try and figure out like who is he right now um but you know it is i feel like they kind of misplayed this from multiple angles yeah um mm -hmm. one in like just 
waiting around for, I don't like the guys that they were putting up here. Weren't good either. They knew that those guys weren't going to get it done. And eventually they would be down to just Vientos and then they'd have to expose him. And Mm -hmm. here we are. So like shocker, nobody could have seen that one coming. Um, And it it just feels like they're constantly being caught unawares on this stuff. And there's not really an excuse for it. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, I mean, again, like a hundred reasons to just, just, you know, overpay with Vientos or whoever, anybody. Mm -hmm. Um, but now he's here and they need to really hope that, again, like you said, lightning in the bottle, he needs right. to be facing any pitcher who is likely to be a good matchup for him. Right. Um, but yeah, no, it's just, it's a very, like, very typical Mets yeah. um, mm-hmm. minor league, you know, yeah. drama that didn't have to happen. And John, Luke, before I get to you, I just, to your point, mm-hmm. Maggie, I just want to get this out there too. You know, as far as the deadline... I, it, it seems like, you know, with, with Vogelback and then Ruff, uh, they wanted to go the route that the Braves went last year. Guys that you weren't going to have to give up a ton, which they mm-hmm. didn't give up a lot for Ruff or whatever. Um, platoon guys that you could play matchups with. That's what the Braves did last year at the deadline. They brought a lot of guys that they could play matchups with, and a couple of them got hot. And I think mm-hmm. the Mets tried to do just that, and it didn't work right. out, unfortunately. You know, they mm-hmm. tried to, to play that matchup game and save a little bit. And like I said, you know, Deciding to get stingy at the deadline when you have, you know, you're you're leading your division. And again, it's a win now team. I think that's ultimately gonna bite them in the butt. But John Luke, I want to hear what you have to say. So the you're right. It, you 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 kind of uh mentioned a little bit what I was uh, gonna say as well. Um so as as far as Vientos goes, you know, everybody knew he was killing it. You know, right. it was it right. it wasn't a secret. But I think at the start, they really wanted to get J.D. Davis going, which is why mm-hmm. he didn't start right. to begin with. And when that didn't materialize, you know, they tried to go the route that you did. And that's, you know, that's the first thing I thought of was they tried to do what the Braves did last year. The right. Braves got a bunch of outfielders who were able right. to, you you know, properly take on different matchups against yep. different pitchers. And it worked out because they got hot at the right time. And we all know that's the most important thing when it comes to um, going to the playoffs and just trying to cruise through, you know, postseason matchups. Yep. Um, I will disagree with you on the, the Darren Ruff trade. I actually liked it going into the trade deadline. Now, could they have done more? Yes, they right. could have. I really think they could have gotten another lefty reliever. Andrew mm-hmm. Chafin was there for the taking. Yeah. But also in the same token, too, you have to also take a look at what teams were giving up for certain type of players. Right. You know, David Robertson, good player, solid reliever. Yes, mm-hmm. but the Phillies gave up a really good pitcher for him. Right. And in this case, do you want to give up a like a Vientos or even an Alvarez or a Beatty for a guy that's like a rental? Now, I understand this is arguably, like I said, the best season that they've had in a long right. time. But in the same token, when you're trying to develop a system just like the Dodgers, you have to at least hold on to some of your youth. So that's why I wasn't too upset about the, the right. Darren Ruff trade, because right. if you looked at his splits against lefties, he was yeah. a monster. Right. And I thought this was like big brain. This is why I'm not a baseball executive because I thought this was big brain stuff (laughs) where they're getting this guy, you get him on the cheap as, as much as people like to say, Oh, we gave up too much for him to be real. As much as we like JD Davis. And as much as a lot of those guys were pitchers, a lot of those guys were probably not, especially Sapaki and the the other three pitchers that they gave up. They weren't going to see the light of day unfortunately and i at least not with the mets so right. if they have good careers with the giants i know sabucky just got recalled the other day to yeah, san francisco right. you know what mm-hmm. good for him he didn't work out here it is what it is that's the cost of doing business and the fact that they were able to get some a player like that who has solid splits against lefties right. and then you mentioned vogel back too you know it seems like epler did overplay his hand with the whole saying that there's a robust market and then you only get one guy okay and and like maggie said there's a lot of just shortcomings with bringing up right. the prospects and there's just a lot of swings and misses um but in the same token with darren rough trade and even with vogel back too you looked at their numbers they it's the typical you know this is a sandy alderson influence what did they do it's like that scene from money ball it's like and what does he do he gets on base <laughs> right so like i said i like the rough trade it's mm-hmm. unfortunate that he's not working out right could they have done more yes they could have it's not a total fail but you know like maggie said you could see it happening the second things started developing so it's just it i don't know what it is about this team that just tends to get caught off guard you know maggie said that and now it's really sticking in my head now <laughs> because it's so true <laughs> You know, it's so true. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it, it's just now we're just going to have to see how they handle everything, you know, with Giorme back and, you know, uh, Escobar being healthy and then Marte comes back. You know, you're probably going to see a couple of different platoons. Right. And right. Viento, I hope Vientos gets more playing time. 
you know, to just add to the notion he does look a little lost. Like, again, he should have been called up earlier, give him right. more time to get used to the major leagues. I mean, you know, and they did it with Beatty. Beatty got called up, you know, end of summer. He had enough right. time to acclimate a little yeah. bit, and he gets hurt, unfortunately, you know? It's so a real shame. I, like, it is. It, yeah. Just, it like, is. Beatty really, like, it's not that he was had like superstar going on, but he right. seems to be solid and, mm-hmm. and adjusting. Right. And you know, the kind of guy you could imagine having that Michael Conforto 2015, where he comes up mm-hmm. and it's just like immediately an above average regular um, and just takes over that role. Like you could see Beatty working in that direction and it just, he just didn't have the chance. It was just right. like, yeah. just really lousy luck. Yeah. And I think Escobar saw that too. And that little, little fire. So if I guess if there was some positive, he saw a young guy maybe taking his job and he said, I don't want that. So, you know, I think at this point, and I think you, you, you'll all feel the same, you know, I, I think maybe, you know, the, the, the division, whether they admit it or not, you know, the, the race is kind of getting on, getting to them now. Um, so for me, you know, we're complaining about a team and rightfully so it's not playing well. They're going to probably win close to a hundred games, maybe a hundred games, and they're going to make the playoffs. So, and whether that's the division or the top wild card, which remains to be seen, I'm just at this point, get healthy, get everyone healthy and make your run then. Cause I just, I kind of feel at this point, I don't want them to, to totally, beat themselves up to a pulp just to win the division. And then you kind of bloody to the, to the end of the road. And then you got no spark come playoff time. And that's that mm-hmm. it's feeling a little bit like that right now. I'd like to see them win the division. Cause I'd like to not have to be in a wild card round where you have to face the Braves or the Padres or the Cardinals or whatever you want those teams to hope, you know, in the Phillies, well, one of them, you know, knock each other out so you don't have to face it. But if it's between winning the division and not having your, you know, your, your main guys healthy and ready to rock or being the top wild card and having your team healthy, uh, fully healthy and, you know, kind of, you know, back on the, you know, the plateau at the right time. I'd rather that, uh, you know, I don't know how you guys feel. And I, you know, we don't want to keep Maggie here forever, but real quick, we'll kind of, you know, wrap on that and just kind of what your thoughts on there. And Maggie, I'll start with you real quick. I mean, it's definitely, you know, they're, they're in the last leg of the marathon. I think this mm-hmm. is where you have to hope that, um, you know, Buck's influence really plays up in terms of, you know, one of the things that has pleased me most about him and, mm-hmm. and surprised me most, not, I guess not surprised me. It's just one of those things that you don't really know until you're watching it every day right. is um, just how good he is with people and how yeah. well he knows them and what they need. And like, you know, I'll never forget. I think it was Peterson even who he pulled from the game in the middle of the at bat. I'm like, yep. that is a man who knows what a player needs. And Mm -hmm. so I'm really banking, you know, Buck, don't let us down um, (laughs) on, on that being a a key for them in this, in this incredibly tense home stretch is just keeping that like extremely that, like that low heart rate, um, just Mm -hmm. keeping everybody, you know, in their place, knowing when to rest to um, because yeah, you're right. You, you know, you don't want these guys completely running on fumes. Um, you want to keep that momentum going when you get that momentum, which the Mets could really use some momentum right now. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, and, and that's, I think that's going to be for me, the, the key for the la- these last three weeks is, is really going to be Buck Walter kind of keep moving all those little chess pieces where they need to be. When have you ever known the Mets to not make it difficult for us? <laughs> That's you know I Very you know true. you talk you, you talk true. about you talk about close races. I'm thinking of '99. I'm thinking of you know uh, 2007, 2008, even 20 you know a little bit 2015 at a certain point. But I think you know you know Maggie made a great point about Buck Walter is that he seems to be the difference maker within everything. You know you look at you look at past managers. You know Terry Collins had a little bit of it, but the Mets haven't really had a manager that can really calm the tide with everything. You know, Terry Collins was great for the Mets in 2015 when they went on their run, you know, obviously with Murphy and Cespedes basically breaking out. But Terry had a good part in that. But, you know, and then, you know, by Bobby Valentine back in the day who the players absolutely love. But then, you know, every other time before that, there was never really a manager in between that really was able to stabilize a lot of the things. And, you know, I don't, I I try not to dump on Luis Rojas, but he just wasn't a good fit with that team last year. So ultimately you hope they get a spark going forward. And, you know, with the way that they're playing as of this recording, you know, and they're playing pretty well, that that can spark them going to Milwaukee, get away from New York a little bit. So I think they win the division. It's going to be a tight race. I don't think Atlanta can sustain that absurd pace. Um, And I think, you know, with 
the pitching staff and all that buck is going to make the right decisions. And I think they'll win the division, win 100 games. And when the last series in October comes and we have already had clinched the division, we're just going to, you know, get the rest that the players need. We're going to sit back, relax, and get ready for some Mets postseason baseball. You heard oh, it here. I want we're that. We're not even ready for Please. that yet. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's a whole different story on that. That's a whole different story. <laughs> oh, man. Well, uh, and one thing to close on that, Edwin Diaz doesn't have a save in September. So that means get leads so the man can pitch. We want the guy in the game. That's another mm-hmm. thing. We need Edwin Diaz in game. So get it right. I think they will. Whether it's, you know, again, you know, John Luke, you're a little more optimistic than me about the division, the way things are right now. But they're making the playoffs. They're going to win a lot of games. They're going to be like a top three seed no matter what. Um, So get excited for it. You know, it's going to be a stressful last couple weeks here. But, um, you know, at least it's uh, it's exciting. It's not like how things usually are around here. And, you know, we're talking about September baseball. Exactly. We're not talking about spring training in September. So this is good stuff. Mm -hmm. But. You know, we're going to close that here. Maggie, thank you so much for coming on the show. Everyone, thank again, so much a for part of me. their own amazing avenue. Everyone, please check it out. Donate, donate, donate uh, for Saturday. That would be amazing. But, you know, until then, guys, we're going to catch up with you next week about everything in Mets land. Hopefully it's, uh, you know, more positive stuff. But until then, let's go Mets. <laughs>